as Frank suggested in the title of my upcoming book, I am somewhat of a fan of pop culture, not of everything, obviously, I can't like everything, but uh, pop culture is, is an interest of mine, and I think it often tells us something about the, the political world. And so with that in mind, I recently went to see the movie World War Z. Now, obviously, the movie is a fiction, and it's about zombies which don't, don't exist, but I watched the movie with a different lens. I watched the movie from the perspective of someone who had worked on not just bioterror, but also just the whole issue of biopreparedness, which looks at the possibility of man-made threats, but also threats that come in nature. And from that perspective, the movie was really a frightening look at what could happen if there were some kind of viral lethal pandemic that efficiently transmitted from human to human that we did not have a countermeasure for. That's what the movie is really about. The zombies are, are kind of an afterthought. And the movie shows what happens societally in the case of, of this type of threat. And there are a couple of things that I noticed in the movie that really tracked what happens in reality. Number one, one thing you see is very quick breakdown in the social order. And in the movie, there's this one scene where Brad Pitt is at a supermarket that's being looted. By the way, if any of you have not seen the movie or are concerned about major spoilers, I won't give any. But, uh, but this sort of setup stuff. Uh, Brad Pitt pits in a supermarket, and there's kind of wild behavior going on, and he's forced to use a firearm to protect himself and his family. And a policeman rushes up. And as the viewer, you're thinking, uh-oh, how's Brad Pitt going to explain that he's really the good guy and the hero and, uh, in the face of this policeman who doesn't know what's going on in the situation? The policeman ignores Pitt, runs to the shelves, takes off what he needs, and runs away. And... This is really something that is a fear for pandemic planners, for all, all disaster planning, is that the first responders won't all serve in the proper first responder capacity in case of a crisis. And we saw this in New Orleans during Katrina when about one third of the New Orleans Police Department didn't do their duty during, during that terrible crisis. Uh, I'm not blaming necessarily everybody, and I mean, people have different reasons for why they act, but if you're a pandemic planner or a disaster planner, you need to keep that in mind. Another thing that comes up in the movie, and I'm going to talk about this a little later when I, when I talk about MERS, is one of the characters in the movie say, says that the airlines were the perfect delivery system for the virus, and, and they are. And it is a concern in this globalized world, you have people traveling all over the globe at any given moment, and they could be carrying something that is dangerous and deadly. Uh, another thing that uh, you saw in the movie is that what, what saves the day, or what is the, the possibility of hope, at least a possibility of hope, is not military might, but scientific knowledge. And in these kind of cases, you're not looking for who has the most tanks or the biggest weapons, but who has the, the best scientific minds and the research and the capacity to address it. And, and one other thing is that the virus originates in Asia, where a lot of the threats have been coming from. Many of the avian flus seem to start from that region of the world. Um, in 2003, it's, it's instructive that in 2003, when the SARS virus broke out, uh, SARS killed about 800 people and cost about $30 billion of damage worldwide. In that instance, it, it started in China, and the Chinese were very quiet and closed-lipped about what was going on. They didn't share information. They didn't share samples with Western health authorities, including the CDC and the World Health Organization. And it's one of the reasons that the, the virus spread as dangerously as it did, and it actually reached Canada. It didn't reach the U.S., but it, it did cause a, a fair bit of damage in Canada. Um, fortunately, in this last outbreak in China of the H7N9, we don't know what the eventual disposition of that will be, but the Chinese have been, I think they've learned their lesson a bit, and they've been much more forthcoming about the, the challenges and recognizing the need to work with, with the Western health authorities. Now, one other thing I, I wasn't planning on talking about, but since I came here, you'll forgive me, but I noticed there's a little bit of overlap between the security policy people and the pro-Israel crowd. So I will talk a little bit about uh, how, the is how the movie depicts Israel, which is a, a, a big set piece. So almost a third of the movie takes place in, in Israel, one of the big countries they visit. And what you find in the, Israel that, that I, uh, in the Israel part that I do think tracks reality is that Israel is aware of the threat for others, acts on the threat in a particularly hard-headed but pra practical and pragmatic way, but also does so in a humane way. They find a way to keep the zombie threat at bay, but they let in people from other countries. And as we have been talking about, and as Professor Rubin was talking about, 
people in the other countries around Israel are not necessarily friendlies, but Israel recognizes the shared humanity of everybody and allows the uh, people from the neighboring countries under their protective umbrella. And I, I, I'd like to think that's what Israel would do in, in the case of a threat like this, because these viruses don't recognize borders. They don't recognize wa uh, walls. If something were to break out, well, not zombies, obviously, but if an H7N9 or uh, some type of avian flu broke out in, uh, in, in the Middle East, it would affect Israelis and Palestinians and Jordanians equally. And from my visits to Israel with Israeli health officials, uh, I, I was surprised and pleased by the level of cooperation and coordination that goes on between the Israeli health officials and the Palestinian health officials. And, and this is corroborated to me by both the Israelis and the, and the Palestinians. And there's actually a hotline that's on the desk of the, uh, US, the Israeli health minister and the Palestinian health minister, and, and they do coordinate a lot. But let's get out of the realm of movies and, and uh, popular fiction and go into the realm of reality. There is this disease that's going on right now. Uh, it's called the, the MERS. Uh, Frank said it's the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. It's, it seems to have originated in Saudi Arabia. It appears to be a coronavirus, which is similar to the SARS outbreak, which I said was, uh, was something that cost uh, 800 lives and, and five, uh, $30 billion. And uh, it, it's... it's it seems to be quite deadly. There's been about uh, 45 deaths so far, 80 people infected. Now, this means that it hasn't spread that far, but the fatality rate is quite high. And with these diseases, you're of, of kind of mixed emotions, because if a disease has a very high fatality rate, it's obviously deadly and dangerous, but it tends not to spread as far because the people who get it don't, aren't ambient, they don't travel around. But if you have a disease that's less deadly but more contagious, it can go and affect more people. And so that, that's, the issue. that's often the issue in the lens through which you look at this. This particular disease is right now um, problematic in, in Saudi Arabia. And the thing that Frank and I talked about on the radio that he wanted uh, to talk about is uh, the fact that the Hajj is coming up in October. And the Hajj brings over 3 million people from around the world into this one central location in Saudi Arabia. 11,000 Americans typically go to the Hajj. And it's kind of like I was mentioning in the movie that airlines are the perfect delivery system. People are converging in this one area, and then they will be spreading out throughout the world. Now, there, there have been other outbreaks going on around the world during previous Hajjs, SARS, for example, and N1. But th none of them have been uh, diseases that appear to originate in Saudi Arabia. So this one is particularly worrisome. The Saudi government, as most people know, is not the most open and cooperative government. And in order to deal with this kind of thing, you do need to be open and cooperative with, with uh, agencies that can coordinate internationally, but also can help come up with, with, with the cure. And one, one problem we've often had uh, is not just China that doesn't share um, information. Uh, Indonesia, for example, has been very bad about sharing virus samples in the U.S. when, when things break out. So you, you need a cooperative government. Uh, but the U.S., when, when in the, in, and this does take place, needs to be quite vigilant about looking at people who are coming back into the country. There are types of thermal scans that I know the Chinese use that you can point it at someone's head and you can tell if they have a fever when they get off the plane. I know that the U.S. has quarantine facilities at our major airports. I've, in fact, toured them when I was at HHS, where they can set off an entire wing, and it's, it's mostly at the coastal uh, airports that have uh, the largest number of international travelers coming in. And there's really something like a dozen uh, airports that really carry the bulk of international travel travelers into the U.S. And, and those airports are equipped to do this kind of quarantine where they just set up an entire wing and nobody can go in or out unless they're approved by health health and security officials. So uh, obviously I wouldn't tell anyone to panic right now. I, I don't know if anybody in this room is going to be going to the Hajj. I don't know if we're allowed in. Uh, but, uh, but, but it is something we're watching for. It's something that U.S. security and health officials should be watching in the World Health Organization should be watching. And in just in general, I think that biosecurity policy is something that I think should be a relatively nonpartisan. I don't, I don't think we should bring politics into it. Uh, what you saw in 2009 when H1N1 broke out was that the Bush administration had a pandemic plan. That's actually a plan that I worked on when I, I was in the government. And the Obama administration was relatively new to town, and they dusted off that plan and used it for, uh, for swine flu. It was prepared for avian flu, but they, they take what's called an all-hazards approach. It's kind of a mix-and-match approach where you can use one hazard plan for different hazards. So it's, a, it's kind of like a, a Lego approach. You, you have certain building blocks in place 
that can be adjusted, but then you just switch in or out what the relevant countermeasures. So I, I think it's, it's very important uh, to, to keep this nonpartisan. But I also think that um, just as the threats evolve, U.S. policy needs to evolve as well. And I think the last few years, there's not been that much creative and intensive thinking on this. And, and I think I'd, I'd like to see some more thought going to this issue and, and more reforms going forward. And so I'll stop there and be happy to take any questions about any of the subjects I mentioned. Great. Anybody going to the Hajj? You first. You're going to the Hajj? <laughs> um, Tevi, thank you very much. Uh, I just, just one point quickly on the, on the mayor's thing. Uh, the trouble is, of course, if the incubation period is sufficiently protracted that people could be exposed, get on the plane, get back into the country without having any thermal indicator of a, of a you know, fever, uh, they could be here. So, anyway, this is a, Absolutely. a, a Absolutely. real concern. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, uh, you're saying that it, the delivery systems by, uh, air, by airline air, and air, airplanes has the International Civil Aviation Organization based in Montreal even taken up this subject? Uh, because as you, we know, that's the international governing body covering international aviation. I'm not sure what you mean by this subject. You mean the MERS virus yeah, the, in particular, I mean, the, or do you the, mean the, general the, the issue of you the... Know, take, you know, taking on this, this question on an international multi-state multi, multi, uh, you know, organization. I mean, I know they've talked about the, the issue of viruses being transmitted, and there are procedures and protocols for how to deal with these kinds of things, but I, I don't know that they've addressed MERS in particular. And I, I think it's kind of early in the, in the threat stage to be talk, to, to, for them to talk about it, but I, I think as we get closer to October, I would hope that they do. Would, would that be an appropriate body to, to focus in on this? Uh, I think that will be one body. Obviously, the World Health Organization is another one that, that's important, and the CDC. Okay. Anybody else? Ben? Thanks, Teddy. Um, are you funding, are you following the funding situation at all as far as protecting against bioterror and pandemic planning, that sort of thing? We're in a budget cutting sequestration yeah. environment after all. Yeah, I, I am. And sequestration has affected it as it's, it's affecting every place in the government. And look, look, my, I'm a, a, I'm a deficit hawk. I think we need to be cutting spending in appropriate places. I, I would not put this on the top of my list of places to cut. There's a lot of uh, um, uh, inappropriate and questionable spending going on in the U.S. government. There's this interesting book that just came out by Kevin Williamson from National Review. And it's called The End is Near and It's Going to be Awesome. Uh, and uh, he talks about the concept of the public good. And he said that Government spending should focus on public goods. The, the classic uh, example of a public goods, obviously, a lighthouse. Uh, back in the uh, when, when shipping dominated uh, international transportation, uh, it makes sense for government to pay for a lighthouse. And so, similarly, I would put uh, bioterror in this public good uh, space. However, what Williamson says that I found disturbing is he said that only one third of U.S. government spending goes on public goods, and the rest of it goes mostly to transfer pay for payments. So, I think we should need we need to look at spending from that perspective of where we can really focus on things that the government should be doing and we should do a little less of things that the, the government should be shouldn't be doing i also uh, am an advocate of what uh, tim Pawlenty, when he was briefly in the presidential race called called the google test if there are things that you can have uh, if you can find these services by google by a private sector organization doing it you shouldn't necessarily have the, the federal government doing these services so i think we just need to be smarter about how we spend our money overall and that will allow us to focus the resources we need on bioterror, because I think that is important use of uh, federal taxpayer dollars. I would. You touched on it briefly with some of the uh, centers where point, points of entry are there. If something were to break out, and using the example of the Hodge, where you've got 11,000 11, people that are going to be entering the country at many several point ports of entry, not for that event, but some future event of that nature. How quickly could we arrest travel and concentrate it into several locuses, such as the old Ellis Island? I mean, that was one of the leading medical facilities in the world at its time, treating blindness and various cures. But it was because they could concentrate people there, they could isolate people there and deal with the issues. Without having the entire country go into a neurotic breakdown or a joint conniption fit, how likely could we arrest travel into certain areas so that 
we could have the CDC and other entities yeah. deal with this problem. It, it's an excellent question, and you mentioned Ellis Island. I actually had a great aunt who was sent back across the ocean because she had conjunctivitis, which as we know is not deadly and, and relatively um, treatable. Uh, but my thought on this is that you, you asked two questions, how likely and how quickly. Quickly, it could be done very fast if we decided that the threat was compelling enough. Likely, I think, is less so because I, I think there's a lot of interests arrayed against it. Obviously, the airlines don't want to see it happen. and uh, There's a very high bar before the U.S. government would do it, and we didn't see it in H1N1. We didn't see it in SARS, although that didn't affect the U.S. Maybe the Canadians should have thought, thought about doing it. But uh, I think it would have to be a really disastrous circumstance, and I think by the time we did it, it, it would probably be too late, not because we don't have the capacity to do it quickly, but I think we don't have the political will to do it quickly. It's a good question. Sorry. Right. It, it, would, it would have to be Ebola-esque, but far more prevalent. So Ebola, Ebola was was frightening, but not that widespread. Something that's uh, that, that's widespread, that's uh, quite contagious, goes from human to human efficiently. It's happening quickly and it's killing a lot of people. That that would be the circumstances in which we could do it. And again, we have the capacity to focus on those air, airports now. Obviously, there are other points of entry, and we all know about um, people coming across the border. And um, I, I was listening to a frightening report on the Laura Ingram show where she talked about how uh, uh, people coming across the, the southern border, there's a very large percentage of them who are called OTMs, other than Mexicans. And, uh, and a lot of those people come from the Middle East. So there are other uh, border entry points. Obviously, this is something we're talking about in the immigration plan. I don't know what's going to happen, but it seems likely that whatever happens, there will be more of a clampdown on the borders, although it may not be uh, significant enough and may not be sufficient. But, uh, but, but we could c close down the major points of, of entry in this, in this circumstance if we need to. That's the basic answer. But uh, just picking up on what you said, we could do that if the main points of entry are air terminals rather than borders. Right. Well, well, they are. I mean, the, the vast majority of people would be coming in through there, but it would be hard to get stop the leakage from the, the border. Yeah. I, I guess, Tevi, just walk through, if you would, in one more burst, mechanically how this works. You, you've, you've set the bar at Ebola. And I, uh, what little I know about that is a pretty horrific disease. Um, if this one has a 60% mortality rate, I guess with the small sample they've got yeah, so yeah, far. Over yes. How does that compare to Ebola? And uh, and just walk through what happens if if people who don't have the symptoms are on a plane and it is an efficient communication uh, kind of disease, uh, interpersonal. By the time people get off that plane, are they likely exposed right. to this and therefore? Has the problem just grown by some order of magnitude? Yep. So th this isn't, first of, all, first of all, I think the, the sample size may be too small to compare it to Ebola, but 50 to 50 plus percent uh, fatality rate is, is quite high and, and more so. In, in terms of the incubation period, it takes some time, but it, we're now in July and the Hajj is in October, so we'll know a lot more about incubation time between now and then. And if it were to evolve to a, that, that kind of Ebola-type level, we could tell people they have to wait 48 hours before they get on a plane to the U.S. So I'm not that worried about the incubation problem, given that there's two months between now and the Hajj. Uh, I think our guys have to just study it more carefully and make assessments between now and then. But, but again, if the, if the time is 12 days as opposed to 48 hours? 12 days is a really long incubation period. Really long. But, but that's, I gather, what they've been saying about it so far. But again, if, if you're on a plane, Scaremonger yeah. here, but are you likely, given the circulation of the air and the system and so on, if it is a respiratory disease uh, phenomenon, likely to find people on that plane as a result exposed and perhaps contracting this thing themselves? Yeah, I don't know if this is going to comfort people or not, but the uh, on an airplane, the biggest issue is not the circulated air because that, that gets filtered, but the people next to you. So if you're in a good row, you're in, in better shape, but if the guy next to you is hacking up, that, that, that's a problem. So uh, I know that that, that can, can be disturbing. But the, the circulate, I mean, if you're in seat 1A and somebody else is in seat 29D, it's less worrisome. 